Good morning. Well, welcome to the CAP National Security Conference. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces, former officials, advocates, congressional staff, and of course, thought leaders across our progressive national security community. Thank you again uh, for joining us this morning. It feels to me a little bit like a big family reunion, uh, which is nice to have, but this is also more than a reunion. It's a little bit more than an average think tank conference because we all have an urgent task before us, to be ready, to be ready to advance a progressive national security and foreign policy agenda on day one of a new presidency, should we be so lucky in November. It is very obvious that there will be a lot of repair work to be done to restore America's principal leadership in the world after Donald Trump. I think the events of the last couple of weeks have shown how bad things have gotten and what danger might lie ahead. It will be no small task to fix all that Trump has broken, from the erosion of our national security institutions, to the credibility of our commitments around the world, to the rampant corruption across our foreign policy. But today is not really about Trump, and it's not about returning to the status quo ante. We need to be ambitious about advancing an affirmative agenda that advances our interests and, importantly, reflects our progressive values and that unifies the American people across generations around a positive vision for our role in the world. And in doing so, it's gonna be very important that we revisit some of our assumptions. And we need to be ambitious despite all the reasons to not be. This won't happen unless we are ready. So today kicks off a CAP initiative to build a 100-day plan for progressive national security that we will release later this year. Our goal today is to have a substantive and interactive exchange with all of you about actionable ideas for advancing a progressive vision across a number of areas, including ending the wars, managing our very complex relationship with China, advancing global human rights, tackling climate change, rebalancing defense and diplomacy, and many more. We're thinking about everything from executive actions to legislation to major policy initiatives to building human capital. There are some really big questions for our community to take on. How do we responsibly end the wars and ensure long-term security for the American people? How do we ensure America can compete with China without ending up in a Cold War? How do we address global human rights while also acknowledging the steps that are necessary to ensure the rights of all Americans at home? How do we put diplomacy front and center again in American foreign policy after years of atrophy and militarization? And how do we dig out on climate change, but also set the bar high for international action while preparing for the security impact of climate? Today's discussions will certainly not cover the full waterfront of issues that we all collectively need to take on, but it's important to start somewhere. But most importantly, CAP cannot do this alone. This effort complements a lot of work that is already underway across our progressive community, and I want to specifically acknowledge some of our closest partner organizations who are here today, including National Security Action, Win Without War, Third Way, Foreign Policy for America, Truman Project, and Human Rights First, and Out in National Security. We hope this conference will generate ideas for all of our efforts across our community. Our community has a lot of work to get to together, and I'm grateful for how strong and collaborative it is, even when we have a range of viewpoints. One thing that is certain, there is a lot of passion in this room and in our broader community, and I'm excited for CAP to be a part of it. So now I wanna give you a few logistical notes. Uh, we are gonna be divided into plenary sessions and breakouts. This is the morning plenary session. We're getting ready to have a panel on the first 100 days. We're gonna have a keynote conversation with Ambassador Samantha Power back in this room after the breakouts. Given the venue capacity constraints, <laughs> we have a lot of people here today, um, which is good. Um, we've had to allocate breakout sessions based on preferences and seating availability. Your badge contains the schedule for the day, uh, as well as directions for which rooms you're gonna be in uh, throughout the breakouts. Just a couple of other reminders, sessions in this room will be on the record and open to the press. Breakout sessions will be off the record and not for tweeting or quoting. Your Wi-Fi hashtag and hashtag information is also located on your badge. 
Finally, I, um, I'd like to welcome uh, to the stage Max Hoffman, who is our Associate Director for National Security and International Policy at the Center for American Progress, and he's going to introduce the first panel of the day. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. It's essentially impossible to reflect on our topic uh, for the day, the critical first 100 days of a new progressive administration, without a nod to the frenetic and productive first three months of Franklin Roosevelt's first term, which gave us the concept itself. FDR, of course, assumed office with one in four Americans out of work. The nation's banks shuttered. The international system was in tatters, torn apart by economic depression, crippling war debt, and trade wars. By the time Roosevelt took his oath, Hitler was chancellor of Germany, Mussolini firmly ensconced in Italy, Japan had begun its expansionist path, and a crisis in neighboring Cuba, often forgotten, augured a new and potentially costly US intervention. Famously, Roosevelt and his aides responded with bold, persistent experimentation. Above all, the president insisted, try something. It's in that spirit that we're all here today to assess the critical problems and priorities that will, we hope, greet a new progressive administration a year from now. Many daunting challenges are clearly visible already and will be discussed in the breakout sessions. There will almost certainly be unpleasant surprises in the months to come. But I think most of us here share the sense that our system is badly frayed and in need of new ideas and renewed commitment. Now, sadly, we can't ask Harry Hopkins what their secret was in 1933, but we do have the next best thing. Along with our moderator, Kelly Magsiman, our three speakers for this morning's uh, discussion were integral to the last time a progressive president took office. In 2009, of course, amid financial crisis and two wars. We've asked them to share their reflections on those critical first 100 days and the balancing act that will confront the next president. Michelle Flournoy is co-founder of West Exec Advisors and co-founder and former CEO of the Center for a New American Security. She was Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from 2009 to 2012 and helped co-lead President Obama's DOD transition team. Dennis McDonough is Senior Principal at the Markle Foundation. After a decade on Capitol Hill and at CAP, Dennis oversaw the NSC's strategic communications in the first year of President Obama's term before serving as assistant to the president and principal deputy national security advisor from 2010 to 2013, when he assumed his role as White House Chief of Staff, where he served for the remainder of the term. Ambassador Susan Rice is a distinguished visiting research fellow at American University and a non-resident senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center. Ambassador Rice has, in fact, been integral to two presidential transitions, serving President Clinton as Special Assistant and Senior Director on the National Security Council from 93 to 97. More recently, of course, Ambassador Rice served as President Obama's first UN Ambassador before she became National Security Advisor in 2013, where she too remained through the end of the term. Her experiences from this remarkable career are captured in her recent book, Tough Love, which is well worth a read. Please join me in welcoming this distinguished group of public servants. Welcome to our first opening panel. I'm very excited to welcome you all here. I've worked closely with all the people on the stage and there are tremendous policymakers, but also tremendous human beings and great mentors of mine. So thank you again for, for joining us today. Um, I'd like to really start with, you know, you've all served on both the front end of administration. Some of you have served all eight years of administrations. So you've seen the full arc of foreign policy under a progressive president. Um, the first 100 days is usually a very hectic time for presidencies, campaigns get you know, very focused on it even before they enter the, the West Wing. As you reflect on your time uh, and the first 100 days of a presidency, what would be your sort of 
practical recommendations for how people in this room who are both policymakers, advocates, congressional staff, how we should all be thinking about planning for that. I realize that 100-day contracts are, are, contracts are somewhat arbitrary, um, but they are useful in terms of generating ideas uh, and creating a, a sort of momentum and thrust at the beginning of a presidency. So that offer to ask for you to reflect on that. Dennis? Good, great. Um, Megs, it's really good to be here. It's great to see so many uh, friendly faces. And uh, it's obviously a great honor to be up here with Michelle and Susan. Uh, so I'll say three things. One is uh, it's all about the people and the ability to execute on campaign promises, which is really the name of the game. Um, you need to have people in place. Um, on that, it's, you know, if you're waiting to think about uh, people until um, the first 100 days, it's obviously too late, which is why I think it's so important, Meg, the work that you're doing focused on the transition, the work that people like uh, the Partnership for Public Service are doing to focus on transitions. Um, and then also really interesting ideas out there, um, including trying to aggregate like a uh, new tech plum book uh, so that we're able to really shorten the distance between Silicon Valley uh, and Washington in terms of getting tech talent uh, into the government. So one is people. Uh, two is um, recognizing that it's going to be hard. Max said that basically this is what we do as Democrats or as progressives. The Republicans screw stuff up and then we have to fix it. <laughs> and uh, if you start, you know, you can start with Wilson, I guess, or you can start with Roosevelt as Max did and you go through to Truman who built the institutions that won the Cold War, to Kennedy who restored American standing uh, and hope and optimism in the institutions. Uh, to President Carter, who again restored hope in the institutions, and President Clinton, who brought us out of the depths of uh, a real economic malaise into uh, being able to capitalize on the fall of the Soviet Union and our triumph in the Cold War, and then ultimately uh, to President Obama stopping us from falling into the deepest, uh, into a Great Depression uh, as we came out of the deepest recession since the Great Depression. It's hard, right? Um, but the fact is our ideas, our people, our commitment uh, are the best ones. And that's proven over time. And the fact that you guys are all rolling up your sleeves today uh, and frankly over the course of time to get those ideas and those people ready uh, means it'll be less hard, but it's still going to be really hard. Um, and then lastly is I just say that you know, maybe it's like 2A, not 0.3, but the reason it's hard is it's hard, it, it's hard to overstate the damage that's been done to our alliances, uh, to our standing in the world. Uh, and while we're basically standing still, China and others are not. And so um, we ought to make maximum use of the time now to ensure that when the bell rings on those 100 days, uh, we make maximum use of that period. That's great. Ambassador Rice. Thank you very much, Kelly, for doing this. It's great to see so many friends and colleagues in the audience. So good morning to everyone. Um, I very much agree with Dennis that personnel is key and the most critical thing to have right uh, in, by the end of that first 100 days, which means starting uh, to think about personnel even before there's a transition and utilizing that transition to maximum effect. The transition is incredibly short, and it will go by in a nanosecond. Uh, and so there's a lot of very sort of nuts and bolts, practical planning that needs to be done. Uh, so personnel, number one. Number two, I would suggest only a handful of early critical policy initiatives. I think you can get sucked into a morass and um, fail to execute adequately if you've got you know, a huge menu of things that you're trying to do all at once at the outset. Four, five big things, domestic and international, uh, that you aim to prioritize, I think makes uh, better sense. Practical things too, like the budget. 
uh, you know, the prior administration will leave behind a budget that is garbage uh, and that bears no resemblance to your priorities. But having an early sense as to what you want to use the money for is absolutely key. Um, very basic things also, like knowing what the calendar is coming up. What are the events, the meetings, the, the things that you're going to absolutely have to confront, not only in the first 100 days, but in the first six months, and being prepared to, uh, to hit the ground running for each of those things. Thinking through very carefully now you know, how you do outreach to friends and partners and allies. The sequence of initial phone calls, of meetings, of travel by the president sends very important messages. And you want to be extremely deliberate about that, especially now, given how much damage has been done to these relationships. It's, it's critical to be intentional. And as Dennis and I can attest, you know, you do, we really only have one president at a time. The Trump administration violated that flagrantly uh, during the transition to some very detrimental effects. Um, but I think we absolutely need to honor it because it's the only way our government can function uh, responsibly. And finally, I'd say, again, in stark contrast uh, to what the incoming Trump administration did, it is necessary and important to spend time with your predecessors and to get the dump, the download, the briefings that you need. Um, you may not agree with them. You may, uh, they may not be as forthcoming uh, as is necessary. But spending that time with your counterpart to understand where things are and where uh, the, the landmines lay, I think, is vitally important. And as you know. Uh, as we know it from our experience at the end of the Obama administration, in the entirety of the national security apparatus, the only meetings that occurred of any substance between counterparts were between me and uh, incoming national security advisor Michael Flynn, not at defense, not at state, not the other critical agencies. And you can imagine um, the kind of deficit that that leaves an incoming administration with if they're serious about trying to govern. Let me just add my thanks to Kelly and to Cap for convening us all. This is such an important time to come together to have this conversation, so thank you for that. I agree with everything that's been said, surprise, surprise, but I wanted to add just a few particular points. So on the people point, um, I think one of the things that distinguishes us is that we want a national security cadre that looks like America. Um, but it's you have to work. You have to put in work to make sure that actually becomes a reality. So now is the time uh, to be doing some of that work. And I just want to give a shout out to a new organization called the Leadership Council for Women in, Inter uh, in, in National Security that Julie Smith and others have been involved in pulling together, which is literally going out and, and looking for qualified middle level and senior women so that when the next president says, I want a diverse national security cadre, there are actually slates of qualified women and hopefully also people of color who are at the ready and ready to be considered for the top jobs in the national security cadre. So there are very practical steps that we should be doing on the people front to try to make sure we kind of live our values uh, uh, when we govern. Um, the second thing is this notion of now is the time to build intellectual capital on the policies we will want to use to govern. You can't wait till the transition time. It's way too short. This is the time we should be using. This is in terms of think tanks, um, thinkers, others, and to start developing a prioritized, as Susan said, a prioritized agenda for what are the most important areas where we want to signal change and that we're changing direction. Um, one of my favorites is the notion of if we really are worried about strategic competition with a rising China, why aren't we investing here at home in the drivers of American competitiveness? You know, the S&T agenda, the research and development, 21st century infrastructure, smart immigration policy, those are all issues that transcend the domestic foreign policy divide. It should be, you know, what, that, what does that agenda look like? That's a, a primary area. Another one that we've talked about is how do we send a definitive reassuring signal to allies? 
and do it early, that this is a new, a new, uh, a new era. Um, and the last thing I'll just no note is that as you set that early agenda, um, we have to be cognizant from, you know, I'm coming at this from a perspective of someone who served in the Pentagon, that you're inheriting from day one a set of operations with Americans in harm's way, uh, from, and you've got to get your arms around those quickly um, and, and make any changes that need to happen. Um, and you're also inheriting a set of potential crises. So again, you've got to get a very quick sense of what could come down the pike, what could explode on my early, the early part of my watch, how do we get our arms around that and make sure that we're ready and positioned. Um, so I think those are some specifics to add to the, the great framework that Dennis and Susan laid out. Great. I want to come back to a few of the things each of you raised. Uh, Ambassador Rice, just from a diplomatic perspective, you talked a little bit about having like the first two or three big plays. If you were coming in as an incoming Secretary of State or incoming UN Ambassador, <laughs> we won't make you do it twice, don't worry. Um, what, what do you mean? Why not? Uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> It'd be great for us. She's pretty good at it. <laughs> but from, from, a, <laughs> from a diplomatic perspective, picking up on the allies' reassuring themes, what would you think are the biggest moves we need to make in the first 100 days? Well, first of all, I don't think we should at all underestimate the difficulty of restoring these relationships and, and renewing them. It, that's not easy. And people are frustrated. They have lost trust. They're impatient. Uh, and the, the depth of their disaffection, I believe, with the United States is deep and real. And it will take, in my judgment, the work of more than a single new administration, even of over eight years, to restore and repair. So being mindful of just how deep that damage is and how much patience, spade work, humility, and the like that it's going to take to restore it is, in my judgment, critically important. Um, allies, 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 yes, uh, vitally important, but we really do need to think about how we go about that. Um, you know, certainly the European allies need extraordinary uh, reassurance. So does Canada. Mm. Uh, so do our Asian allies. Uh, and you know, we have traditionally thought of these groups of alliances as distinct, the Asian allies, the, the, the North Atlantic allies. Uh, and with Trump making everything extremely transactional uh, and, and bullying, um, we not only have to, to, to try to repair in the most practical sense that damage, but I think we need to be thinking about uh, how we view our alliances anew. And so if we could envision almost a renewal of our vows to NATO, mm -hmm. uh, and, <laughs> you know, or, you know, a, a, a new, you know, a, what, you know, you stand up and you recommit, you, know, you know, go back to the altar uh, and apologize for your transgressions. <laughs> I think we need something almost akin to that uh, in, in diplomatic terms. But I also think we need to increasing look, increasingly look at ways to knit together our Asian and North Atlantic uh, alliances and partnerships, not only on the security front, but politically, diplomatically, and economically. So that's an area where I'd suggest there's some real rebuilding to do. I would also suggest, um, for two reasons, that a new president seriously consider sending as ambassadors to these critical core European partners, career ambassadors. I know that's you know, atypical, but what that would do apart from a, a very steady and, and apolitical hand is also send a critical message to the deeply uh, beleaguered uh, foreign service and, and, and career civil service that they count and that they matter and that we're doing business differently. Um, in the same vein, I think we need an early and aggressive initiative uh, to try to restore capacity as well as morale to the State Department. And we should be looking for legislative uh, assistance in order to be able to try to bring back 
many of those who have left, who left not necessarily because they wanted to, but because they felt they had to, and enable them to come back on terms financial and in terms of their retirement and their prior <laughs> status that uh, enables them to um, pick up in effect where they left off. That's a complicated thing bureaucratically, and I think it probably would require some legislative relief, but it's absolutely essential. We can't repair the damage that has been done to our career foreign and civil service, and frankly, not just in state and AID, but across the board, uh, without some very deliberate, urgent steps that enable us to recoup the talent that we can possibly still recoup. A um, couple other things. I think in the realm of new initiatives, as I said, you know, if you had a handful of things that you really aimed to, uh, to lay on the table in the early days, I think obviously there's some the ripe areas, but I think the most compelling, arguably, is in the realm of climate. And to go way beyond just recommitting to Paris, but having out of the box a bold US-led initiative to take us well beyond where we would be had we adhered to Paris. Um, and to, to try to reclaim and restore the, the leadership role that we once had. And to do it not only, not in isolation, but in partnership with, uh, with uh, key allies and, and others who aren't allies like China and India who've used the opportunity of our vacation from climate change to, to, to scramble the table. And finally, I'd just say that uh, we also need to restore certain norms as to how we conduct foreign policy and how we engage in the rest of the world. If, if I were in a position of leadership, I would ban making foreign policy by tweet. I, I don't mean that just to be flip or uh, you know contrary. It, it is not an appropriate vehicle for serious substantive statements. It, it uh, evades the necessary spade work often of consulting with allies and partners, dealing responsibility and consulting with Congress. It's, too, it, it's flip, it's short, and it, it doesn't give weight to the decisions of the sort that, that have to be made. Um, I would restore regular press briefings not just at the State Department, but in the other agencies and, and at the White House. We need to, early on, uh, go back to some of the basics that we've learned in the course of this administration are not mandated, uh, are, are not law or even rules, but norms that have served our decision-making process and our leadership role uh, very well, and that in the absence of, we're seeing the consequences. Thank you, Brie. Um, Michelle, the Pentagon, <laughs> the big behemoth of the Pentagon. Uh, President Trump has clearly politicized the military at various points in his administration. We have reports of very low morale uh, across the defense civilian uh, staff. We have reports that the military has taken an outsized role in some of the planning and decision processes within the Pentagon. And of course, we're also, as progressives, staring down at quite a very large uh, defense budget that is, I think, on an unsustainable trajectory. So as an incoming progressive administration, you've, you've been on the front end of, a, of one. You've had to deal with the intricacies and the behemoth that is the Pentagon. How would you approach the Pentagon transition? So I, I do think that there, it, the state of civil military relations inside the Pentagon, except at the very top, is not in a good place. It's not healthy. Um, and that comes from, frankly, um, goes back to the first thing we talked about, which is this administration came in totally unprepared on the people front, and there was a huge vac vacuum on the civilian side of the Pentagon for a very long time. Um, and you know, the, the, the parts of the military institution kind of filled in the vacuum uh, to support Secretary Mattis, and that has not sort of been rebalanced. And I think what you what you lose is um, a lot of you know, good ideas, talent, uh, and just the value of having civilian oversight and control of military planning operations and so forth as is appropriate um, in a democracy. And frankly, I think there are many in the uniform military who would welcome the return of a strong civilian partner. 
I think there are many who are very uncomfortable um, having been put in the position that they've been put in. So having a strong civilian team come in, sort of as much as you described for the national security decision-making process, resetting the internal decision-making processes of the Pentagon to be civilian-led and supported. Um, Claire being very clear on goals. I also think there's a huge opportunity to come in with a sort of lessons learned mindset. We've had 20 years um, since 9-11. We've been through Afghanistan, we've been through Iraq, we've been through the global war on terror. There's a lot that we should, un, you know, we should have a perspective on what works, what doesn't work, uh, and not. And this then relates to the budget. I think even, Again, I think most people, most senior military leaders are already saying they understand that the current level of defense spending is not sustainable. Um, even you know, the, the Mick Mul Mulvaney has signaled that in a second Trump administration, God forbid, <laughs> um, the defense budget wouldn't stay at the same level. We have to think about the budget in terms of what's the national security budget and what's the Defense Department piece of that. A foreign policy built on two course of instruments, uh, sanctions and the military, is not an effective foreign policy. You can't have one instrument on steroids, uh, as much as we like a strong military for deterrence and all of that, with everybody else on life support. Um, so we have got to think about our budgets in national security terms and saying, how, does, how do we continue to invest in def smart defense while also rebuilding the State Department, USAID, informational tools, and so forth. Would you, I mean, there's been a lot of talk for many years about a unified national security budget. Is that something you think a new team I, should take on? I think that perspective is the right one. I'm not sure it's manageable to do a unified single budget. And I do think if we, even if an administration did that, until you reform Congress, they're gonna break it into the little pieces and run it through the individual committees. But I think what you can do is by mission area. Like, what is a whole of government smart approach to counterterrorism going forward? What is a whole of government smart approach to climate as a national security issue? What is a whole of government smart approach to dealing with a rising China? And you can get a lot of, a lot of the distance that you need to get by taking a mission-based approach and, and looking at it from an integrated perspective that way. That's smart. Um, so this sort of raises the question of, there's always a lot of enthusiasm uh, at the beginning of administration of making big change and having impact. And that's great and we want to sustain that. But how do you sustain that across, you know, years of an administration? Um, how do you work with the broader foreign policy community, including the advocacy community, to really keep energized around the agenda that you're trying to get done? Dennis, you have yeah. straddled this on multiple fronts. Um, what would your advice be to people in this room about how to both make impact and change and maintain that enthusiasm across our community. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Uh, um, I, by the way, I, I see your new colleague, Mara Rubman, in the back there. It's a nice hire for Kat. Um, so, uh, she's in the back on the wall over there. Um, so uh, I want to just say two things real quick to, to uh, jump off of what Susan and, and Michelle have said. One, just this question of calendar and crisis that Susan, both Michelle and Susan referred to. You know. There's a bunch of things where the president is, the current president is trying to say that he's resolving a problem when in fact he's ignoring one. Um, a perfect example of that is the crisis on the border. And if you think about uh, when the president-elect will be coming in uh, with his or her uh, transition team, uh, think about the fact that you know, you'll just be in the early days of the seasonal upswing of migration you'll be in a position where there's a lot of pent up demand, if not expectation, on the border that has not been addressed by any significant um, investment in development in uh, the northern Central American region. And so the president-elect will have uh, a crisis right on his or her hands uh, because the president, current president is so fundamentally ignoring the challenge. Um, so in that respect, I'm really happy to know that Dan Restrepo and a couple others are working on this expressly to Michelle's point about the intellectual property and having a view uh, about what should happen. Then this question of norms I think is really important. 
um, just, just put a fine point on it. We had a pretty big debate about the strategic framework agreement with the Iraqis uh, in two, late 2008, early 2009. And you recall that embedded in that strategic framework agreement and negotiated by the Trump administration, uh, the Bush administration, uh, was a timeline to reduce the American presence uh, in Iraq. And uh, there is debate in our team about whether we shouldn't accelerate that reduction. But at the end of the day, a very powerful normative argument uh, that has held true over many, many administrations, Republicans and Democrats, until now, uh, until now uh, carried the day, which is to say that an agreement with a president, irrespective of the party of that president, was considered binding on the incoming president uh, by that president himself, heretofore all having been men. The <laughs> point I'm trying to make is that I think we have a question of, but we will have a question about that. The progressives, Democrats will have a question about that to resolve. In that specific case, but in a series of other norms, which is it, do we want to try to restore the respect, for example, the independence of the Department of Justice? Uh, do we want to have an attorney general who will restore the post-Watergate view of the independence of the attorney general? And these are not easy questions to resolve, and they'll be spirited to debate, but we should, as Susan said, be very intentional about those questions. Um, now, then, then the question about um, how to make best use of people and the best use of the time, which I think is really your question to me, Megs. Um, look, I think that um, the, the main thing is uh, you gotta show up and you got to engage the question. I love Susan Rice, OK? <laughs> I can tell you that Susan Rice and I had it out on a number of different occasions, right? And I think We have I'll, witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. Some of these get written up in the books. You didn't write it up, though. Oh, so, man. That's because yeah. I love you. <laughs> um, but the point is, let's have it out. And, and uh, you know, nobody's, these are hard questions that we have to resolve. Mm -hmm. And we should make sure that in the tradition of progressives and the tradition of taking on big challenges, you know, let your hair down and have it out a little bit. And uh, that means both inside the government, so having a robust interagency process. Apparently now they don't have many interagency meetings because it gets too substantive and too, <laughs> too spicy. Um, but we, we should be comfortable with that. The other thing is we should make sure that we recognize that Congress has congressional responsibilities yeah. embedded in Article 1. I love Article 2 now, but I used to really like Article 1. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is that there's people who have responsibilities under each of those articles that need to carry them out. And you shouldn't hide from that. You shouldn't engage that. And so at the same time that we should be engaging opportunities for um, gathering information, ideas um, from each other inside the, the administration, uh, inside a transition team, within the broader community of thinkers, uh, we should also be we recognize that we have a lot of really interesting, experienced voices on Capitol Hill, and there's a lot of interesting, experienced Republicans as well. And so um, those things don't happen, as we now witness, unless you're intentional about it. So my, my main answer to your question, Megs, is to just be intentional about it. That's great. Can I pick up on the congressional theme? Because a number of us are thinking about, well, what if you have you know, potentially a Democratic Senate? Woo. Um, or if you don't, if you're facing, you know, potentially a uh, hostile Congress and you're trying to implement a progressive agenda. Um, we had, you know, fits and starts on that, I think, in the, in the Obama administration. Looking back on that, all of you, because you've all interacted so closely with Congress in your different roles, how would you be thinking now about the relationships that are necessary to build, the coalitions that are necessary to build, to get some of that, that big agenda work done, potentially with either a friendly Congress or a non-friendly? 
I would just say that from my perch in the Pentagon, I think that one of the lessons I took away was that the times when we were smart enough to bring key congressional staff and members in early on an initiative or on a problem set that we were trying to solve and kind of make them you know, part of the, the, the group that's trying to think it through and craft a solution, we tended to do a lot better <laughs> in those situations. Now I understand there are times when you can't, uh, it's you know, harder to do that, but I think more interaction, more informal interaction, more investment in building key relationships, more sharing of the problem set and enlisting um, good thinking on solutions, I think the more we can do of that, the better we tend to do in actually getting things executed or getting things funded. Yeah. Susan, I, 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 I'd say, I, I guess I'd say uh, one thing is, there are two things. Um, one, that, that by no means that we, especially did I, have it all right. I think my colleagues did. I think I did not a, a great job of this, <laughs> but uh, intentionality in showing up is, you know, uh, well more than half the battle. And so that's point one. Point two is that there's a big debate about whether our Democratic candidates should be more realistic, they say, about how you deal with Majority Leader Senator, uh, Senator McConnell. And that somehow they should trim their sails on their ideas because Senator McConnell won't be for those ideas. Uh, I think when a Democrat wins, I think there's a really interesting challenge in Washington for somebody else name of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And what does the Republican Party post-President Trump want to be? It's a party that at the moment so, um, that looks so uh, in opposite of what it has been historically on fundamental ideas that I think uh, some of the analysis in the press would benefit from asking that question, which is what kinds of choices will the Republican Party make post-President Trump. Are they comfortable where they are? I think we've all had these conversations. Privately, they tell you they're very uncomfortable where they are. They can't say that publicly because that gets them in trouble with the President and the White House. Um, but I think they're going to have to ask themselves some questions. Are they comfortable being so associated with um, a movement of very non-diverse, much older uh, voters when the country is changing and has been changing? Are they, very, are they comfortable being where they are as a party on national security matters uh, on questions like alliances, um, where historically some of our Republican colleagues have been uh, among the more robust defenders of NATO and, and uh, our alliances in Asia? And so these are interesting questions that I think the Republicans, too, are going to have to wrestle with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to come back to a couple of things. Can I just say oh, one thing on this point? There's going to be an enormous temptation on the part of a new administration to take advantage of this administration's habitual uh, jettisoning of all of the rec requisite norms. You know, the president and the administration lie every day and apparently have gotten away with it. They ignore and vilify Congress and the courts. Uh, and they have abused the press. And to a, a very frustrating and concerning extent, at least thus far, it hasn't cost them greatly. And so, you know, there will be those who question why an, a, a new administration of the opposite party uh, ought to play by rules that the other team doesn't. And I think we've got to be very clear and very committed to resisting that temptation mm -hmm. and recognizing that at the end of the day, you know, we are serving because we care about this country. And these norms that have been violated of truth, of transparency, of accountability, of respecting the fact that we have a separation of powers, uh, ultimately serves the country well even if in the in a moment it may not be politically expedient. Um, and I can't tell you how frustrated members of Congress are with how things are operating or failing to operate here in Washington. Uh, I spent some time up last week with um, 
the Democratic caucus, and there is this pent up uh, fury um, that their role as the Article One branch has been completely disregarded. And of course, you know, it, it, Iran is, and the, the lack of consultation, the lack of information, lack of transparency is just the most proximate example. But whoever comes after that is going to have to deal with that fury. It's not going away. Mm. And unless we uh, come in with a, 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 a real respect for uh, the other branches of government and an almost overcompensating for um, what has happened, which is completely antithetical you know, to all of us who worked in the executive branch, <laughs> uh, and, and not expedient in many respects. But again, for the long-term health of, of the democracy, I think vitally important. Um, I, I think the blowback we receive from our own yeah. colleagues in Congress, our own party, would be really com uh, detrimental to any kind of governing agenda. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, speaking of governing agendas, there's always, there's a domestic agenda, and then there's a foreign policy agenda, and we all know that we have one president <laughs> and so much limited time, and usually the, the way it works is, you know, domestic policy folks and foreign policy folks are fighting for time on the president's schedule. Um, that's a very common theme, but nowadays it feels to me like one big paradigm shift is the connections and linkages between domestic and foreign policy. And Michelle, you raised it in your opening comments about how if we're gonna compete with China, much of that is gonna be driven by the decisions we make on the domestic policy side, the economic policy side. You raised the importance of technology and shrinking the, the gap between the Silicon Valley and the US government. So how should we be thinking about the connections between domestic and foreign policy? There are obviously constraints and, and trade-offs but how do we find synergies between them and leveraging that uh, in a new presidency? Dennis, I don't know if you want to kick that off. And... Well, I mean, uh, the, I think a lot of it is, as you've suggested, Kelly, self-evident. And I think it's, I think as everybody, the work of everybody in the room uh, has made clear now that uh, the, our, we can't really wall ourselves off from uh, these uh, challenges overseas. And so uh, I think one being eyes, eyes wide open about it. Two is, um, you know, I think having a functioning uh, set of processes inside the agencies and then across the agencies inside the White House um, to ensure that uh, you're making decisions transparently um, and informed by the full range of responsibilities that the president uh, has is, the the best uh, way to do business. You know, I, I the I used to to say to people that you know that it's been we're on our forty fifth president, but there's only been forty four for historic vagaries that we can talk about another time. But <laughs> every one of those presidents has had a piece of the White House, right? Washington didn't live there, but he negotiated to purchase the South Lawn. Uh, Adams lived there for several months, left a nice quote on one of the fire uh, places. Um, obviously, Madison had to move out because uh, of the Brits. Thanks a lot. Uh, I hold the Canadians partly responsible for that. The, and then the Trumans had to move out. But everybody had a piece of it, right? Um, by the way, the Trumans had to move out because they did such a bad job re <laughs> reconstructing, reconstructing it after the Madisons moved out. But um, the point is that the institutions and the processes and the norms that are developed inside that building uh, are important. They come up for a reason. And I think the question for policymakers and for uh, leaders is to ask themselves whether they're in a unique situation where somehow those processes and the wisdom that was you know, generated over years, as Susan said, out of the, the battle among the three branches is useful and applies to the situation you're in, or if somehow you're in such a new scenario that you should just do things entirely new. And throwing out the, his, the history of that council. And we have a president now who's testing the, the, the latter. 
Um, but one of the real lessons, I think, at the heart of uh, that experience is uh, what came out of World War II and the National Security Act of 1947 and what Susan uh, did so well as National Security Advisor, which is having a place where these questions uh, are wrestled to ground. So Susan would invite the NEC director, the DPC director, to ensure that there is visibility across that, those lines of effort uh, to inform these decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess what I'm saying is that the, the prescription for what ails us is not for us to be less what we are, but to be more of what we are. And what we are is collaborative, argumentative, transparent, progressive, thoughtful leaders. And when we're back to that, there's no challenge, irrespective of how big it is or how knotted up it is between foreign and domestic that we can't handle. I mean, we've, that building's seen it all, <laughs> right? And done a pretty good job of it along the way. That's great. Um, well, maybe I'll uh, have one more question and we'll go to the audience. There's a, obviously a lot of bad news around the world, lots of challenges that we're all gonna talk about later today in breakout sessions. You know, we've got a rise in China, we've got challenges with our allies now that we're gonna have to restore credibility with, we've got climate, you name it, forever wars. If you're looking around the world and where American interests lie, where do you see some strategic opportunities? Um, I, we tend to dwell, I think, a lot on the, as national security people, we tend to dwell on the crises, but thinking ahead about where the U.S. can be and where we want to take uh, the world, where do you see some opportunities for a new team? Where do you want to start? Where, all start with the, smart, the smartest Start part. with the smart one. Michelle? <laughs> Go ahead. I think there are a number of opportunities, but I'd start with many things that fall under the rubric of renewing our moral leadership. Uh, leading again on democracy and respect for human rights. Uh, elevating development and re-energizing and reforming the way we do it. Uh, tying it appropriately to trade and investment, but really putting our money where our mouths are and uh, making sure that in our early budgets, um, you know, the Trump administration's early budgets wanted to cut the 150 account by 30%. Uh, we should be looking at very thoughtful and deliberate ways to um, not just restore money that is cut. Frankly, thankfully, Congress didn't let that happen to the fullest extent, but there are definitely elements of our um, capacity to invest in, in development um, that have been neglected in, in recent years. So um, investing in dem democracy, human rights, development, multilateral diplomacy, um, multilateral trade opportunities, um, I think are all important aspects. I think we need a radical r shift in our approach to refugees, to immigration, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, to openness to the world, allowing um, well-vetted um, but substantial numbers of students to be able to come back to our universities. Um, we have put up not just literal walls, but, but uh, practical walls uh, that have cut us off and our institutions off from uh, not only the, the, the talent uh, and, and the innovative capacity that is out there in the rest of the world, but has built up real barriers to people's willingness to trust and cooperate with us. And I think on this people front, the human dimension, mm -hmm. there are vital opportunities to, to do and more and better. And obviously, you know, undoing the travel ban and, and all of that stuff fall into that category. Um, I've talked about climate. I've talked about revitalizing our uh, alliance uh, structures. Um, I'd add, I think there are, I mean, uh, there's obviously some urgency on the question of new start uh, and whether or not uh, we try to seize an opportunity to, to renew it. I think we should, and I think, but beyond that, there are opportunities in arms control that, that we shouldn't be uh, shy to, uh, to take advantage of. Um, and then, you know, I could go on and on, but, you know, 
just to give one more example of, of areas that have been so badly battered that don't serve our interests that we need to be looking at anew, and that's our whole relationship with the Palestinians. Uh, you know, having cut off all our aid, having, you know, killed UNRWA in effect, having, you know, done a series of things that basically completely uh, marginalize and, and destroy that relationship. We need to, re to assess whether that's really where we want to be and whether that's sustainable. Obviously, I think it's not. Uh, and so I think in the whole nexus of our relationships, both with respect to the Israel-Palestine relationship, but also with respect to the broader Middle East, we have some rethinking and refreshing to do, to put it mildly. Yeah, agreed. Michelle? I would just, I would endorse everything Susan suggested, just to add a couple of ideas. Um, one is that we seem to, or well, this administration has sort of forgotten the art of diplomacy. Um, even when we've been, even with our fiercest competitors, if not our adversaries, we've in the past figured out ways to have strategic dialogues with them. We need a strategic dialogue with China. Part of the problem is that we're doing this, we're approaching them in this very transactional and highly unpredictable and highly un inconsistent way. Um, we need to be in a much deeper multi-dimensional dialogue with them. We need to try to find areas where even as we compete, we can't make the progress we need on climate change or on nonproliferation or, and you know, name your list of transnational or global problems without China uh, in some kind of partnership. So um, we have to, and oh, by the way, we're in a new world with the technologies that Dennis mentioned, AI, cyber, space. What are the norms? What are the rules of the road that are going to define how we maintain strategic stability when we're in a very new technological era. That requires dialogue and discussion even with, you know, um, some of our, the, the, the countries that challenge us the most. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, you know, we'll all sing kumbaya and all agree on a set of norms and everybody will abide by it, but the value of doing the norm setting you may be able to take certain really catastrophic things off the table by mutual agreement. And where you disagree, if you get enough of the you know, democracies, the, the countries that share a common set of values and interests on board with a set of norms, then that becomes the basis for international action uh, to hold those who violate those norms accountable. So I think there's value in that. The second thing I would just highlight is the U.S. government is an amazing demonstration platform. You know, if I think one of the casualties of this presidency has been the word of the president, the word of the United States of America. We are going to have to sh take action to show that we mean what we say in any future administration. And one of the things that we can do is to uh, challenge ourselves to actually walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So for climate change, the U.S. government is probably, you know, if not the largest, one of the largest real estate holders in the United States. It's one of the largest energy consumers in the United States. It's one of the largest fleet operators of the United States. I mean, it's a com tremendous demonstration platform to hold ourselves accountable to the kinds of standards that we're going to be hopefully reclaiming leadership on and asking others to kind of raise the bar for themselves. So I think there's tremendous opportunity in figuring out how do we not just kind of talk a new talk, but walk a new walk, using the US government as a platform for demonstrating that we're serious about change. I, I won't add any substance to, I think, uh, all the good stuff that Susan and Michelle have said. But I, I just reframe the question to say why Am I, notwithstanding all the bad news, why am I optimistic? Um, and I'd say two things, which is, one, if you look at all the Democratic candidates, uh, all of them envisions a pretty massive uh, increase in R&D funding, which is uh, obviously the lifeblood of what uh, will undergird a lot of what Susan uh, and Michelle have just said. And then the other reason is, especially, by the way, if Julie is as successful in her work as she obviously should be, as Michelle talked about, the other reason I'm optimistic is because of this group and this team. And imagine if we put this, the, the team on the table 
that actually takes advantage of all the strength and capability that the American people offer uh, in a team that looks like America. And so that's why, as Michelle said, so that's why notwithstanding this bad news and informed by these good ideas, I'm extraordinarily optimistic. Optimistic about the outcome in November, by the way, but, and then optimistic about the idea that um, you know, our best days are, uh, are ahead of us. As President Obama used to say, we, we don't fear the future. Right? We, we uh, run headlong into it, informed by the experiences that we have and by the people who we harness. All right, I'm going to collect a few questions from the audience. Um, so if you have a question, uh, raise your hand. I'm going to collect two or three at a time, and then we can distribute them. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, this lady in the back here, please identify yourself and keep your question as short as possible. You guys answer all the questions. Kim Dozier with Time Magazine. Do progressive Democrats, or Democrats in general, have a plan to win with grace? Or does there have to be a certain amount of bloodletting, do you think, after the fact about what has happened in the past four years, kids in cages, et cetera? That's a question. All right. Uh, next question. Anyone over on this side of the room? Uh, this gentleman here in the front. Uh, we're going to have the mic for you, sir. Hold on just a second. Yeah, there's a, there's a mic coming behind you. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Paul Applegar. I want to echo first Susan's comment about the importance of a smart national development strategy and using that as a tool for national security. But my question really goes back to building and rebuilding alliances. And uh, I just want to see what the prospects would be where, at least I believe, we snatch defeat from the jaws of victory with the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and rebuilding it in some form or some way. I don't care if we call it the Trump Pacific Partnership, but to rebuild that um, a group of countries working together seems to be a good thing. I'm just curious what the prospects would be for that. Could, great. Could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear it very well. Basically, I think uh, TPP. Is there an opportunity okay. to, to reconstitute or rebuild it, re-engage on that uh, question? Uh, the gentleman right here in the, in the middle, please. You see these folks in the back, Kelly? Uh, my name is Tom Melia. Um, I'm now with PEN America, uh, served in the Obama administration in a couple of agencies. Um, my question is about the first 100 days, it, and you've pointed to a couple of early crises that the new administration will be confronting, like uh, the border and so on. But there's going to be a big crisis from election day to inauguration day and through those first 100 days if a Democrat wins because the outgoing president won't want to leave, and he will be undermining the credibility of the election in which he has lost. He's laying the predicate for that every day, that the system is rigged against him, et cetera, et cetera. So the biggest crisis, it seems to me, will be affirming and assuring the American public of the legitimacy of what will be a messy, complicated, compromised election if a Democrat wins. How high on the priority list would you put that? Okay, three good questions. Uh, who wants to take the grace, <laughs> winning with grace question? I think we're all very graceful. I don't know about you, but. I think, uh, <laughs> I mean, absolutely we can win with grace. And that is, I think, our, our instinct, and that has to be our, uh, our guiding principle. I, I see no benefit in, uh, you know, engaging in retribution or, uh, you know, behaving in the, in the fashion that we've spent four years decrying. I'll take the TPP question so Dennis can take the last one, which was a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> he was the White House Chief of Staff. But, uh, you know, the I'm, defense person <laughs> snatches a TPP the, yeah. <laughs> No, the but because I our think, policy. no, I mean, TPP, no, I think I'm our failure, you know, the fact that we, one of our, the great successes of the Obama administration is that we led the negotiation of the TPP and we got it to the point of others signing it. But I think our biggest strategic mistake, given the strategic importance of Asia to U.S prosperity and security over the next 50 years. No, no region will be more important. Um, the opportunity to have a high standards agreement, to kind of raise the bar, and to be central in that effort was a real missed opportunity. Now, um, I don't know that we can just 
waltz back into it, even though our allies and partners have kept the door open for us, and for that we're grateful. Um, but I do, th I do hope the next president will make the strategic argument for why it's so important for us and why it benefits the American people if we accompany TPP with legislation that addresses the needs of some of the populations that have been most hurt by trends like automation by certain aspects of globalization and so forth. We don't, we t historically haven't been able to pass much in the way of multilateral trade deals without that accompanying investment domestically. And so what my hope is that you'd have a democratic pre president who would lead that charge and, and, and get us back in there. And that would do a lot, in terms of action speaking louder than words, that would do a lot to reassure our Asian allies. Yeah, so um, I, I just add two sentences to what Michelle said, which is that I, this goes to the point about making sure that we're taking advantage of the good thinking of our members of Congress. I, I was very proud of the speaker and the team in the House and the demands that they put on the new US-Mexico-Canada agreement, uh, really drawing on many of the innovations at the heart of the TPP to example, for example, to put enforcement, uh, including labor enforcement and union membership questions in the heart of the agreement rather than as a side agreement. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of good progress that's been made on thinking around uh, what new trade agreements should look like to uh, couple uh, with Michelle's good uh, observations. And I think that's as a result of uh, democratic leadership in the House, which brings me to the, the last point about this transition. I think that the, the most important thing I think that voters can do is to recognize that their vote matters. Um, one of the reasons that Democrats were in the position uh, that they were in to influence the USMCA as uh, profoundly as they did is because of these new young, uh, by the way, principally women members of Congress. And that's because turnout in 2018 was the highest for a midterm election in 100 years. And when you even desegregate that a little more and ask, you know, 18 to 24 year olds in 2016 voted that about 23%. Uh, so the best way to guard against uh, things we can't control is to control the things that we can. And the thing that we can control is registering to vote and turning up to vote. Uh, and I think you see a lot of exciting opportunities about this uh, being undertaken uh, on this across the country. And that's winning with grace, too, which is getting new voters into the system, overcoming uh, anti-democratic, small-d democratic efforts by the opposition to make it hard for people to vote, forcing older voters to stay out, long lines, people of color to stay out in long lines. Uh, that's in our control to turn people out, uh, to, to let there be no doubt uh, about the outcome. And just a one last point about that, which is, la I, I gather that the midterm election uh, reduce the average age of a member of Congress by 10 years. <laughs> and so uh, that's an that's a astounding number. Uh, and as we think about where the energy uh, for these challenges that we face will come from, it's from that voting base and from that team of colleagues that will represent uh, all of what America has to offer. Great. That's great. Um, well, we're at time, um, but thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, so Thanks for sharing the wisdom. Thanks, guys. And I just want to say just one more thing about these three. Each of these three people has been instrumental in building the Democratic National Security Bench, and I really want to thank you for it. Uh, I think you're seeing the fruits of it today, and hopefully we'll continue to see the fruits of it in the future. So thank Excellent. you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you.